Hi, welcome again to the show. I'm Leslie Choice. My guest today is Edward Rich, Newfoundland novelist uh, whose books include Rare Birds and a new one called The Nine Planets. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Now listen, I laughed long and hard when I read Rare Birds, then I laughed long and hard when I saw the movie, which you write the screenplay for, and you have a new book too that's pretty darn funny as well. Go back to Rare Birds for a minute. Sure. I'm, I'm wondering where that story came from. Were, were you like an honest-to-God bird enthusiast? No, no. I, uh, I, not a bird enthusiast. And I think like uh, most authors, like the nascence of these things is, uh, is really variable. It's one thing feeds off another. Uh, I have a friend and an acquaintance who's, who's insane. And uh, he was talking seriously about fashioning a homemade submarine. And uh, we, of course, all said, you're crazy, you'll die. And which comes you'll, up in the story. Yeah, which you comes up in the story. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you'll die alone, <laughs> you know, because we're not going with you. Uh, so th that was in my head. And then I heard a story, and I'm going to be very cagey about telling this story. Uh, I heard someone, perhaps at a cocktail party or something, talk about finding a bird, uh, the actual, actually found a bird that was extinct on the coast of Labrador. Yes. I can't name the bird. And couldn't report its finding to science because the numbers were so small that these twitchers, these obsessive bird watchers, would invade this isolated area of Labrador and destroy the habitat and the train just to list the very bird that was thought extinct. So to check it off. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so the, the numbers were so small and the birders were such a threat, they were so obsessive that they couldn't report this. And I thought, well, that's mad. <laughs> and I, I sort of did some sort of casual research about birders. And then it's, you know, in the end, they're, they're just collectors of any kind. Uh, they're obsessive collectors of any kind. And because um, to me, birds, uh, my, my interest in birds and knowledge of birds is all uh, after the book, which is funny, you know, right. it didn't inform the book. And I've always liked birds because they're pretty and they have wonderful songs and I, yeah. I couldn't identify one. Uh, there's a very funny uh, uh, anecdote from St. John's. I was listening to the local radio, the CBC radio in St. John's, and a rare bird was spotted in someone's backyard uh, in St. John's. And of course, people were aware of the book and the movie, and they were trying to, <laughs> when they were doing the interview, they didn't want to really step into any of the terrain that had happened in the fictional account. And uh, so they were very careful. But at the end, uh, the, uh, the interviewer, I said, so this is uh, an exceptionally rare bird. And the uh, ornithologist that they were questioning said, he said, well, it's no Tasker sulfurious duck, but it's rare. So uh -huh. he used the, the fictional bird in the book as a, as a reference point for birds that are you know, extremely rare. So that was, that was nice to know. There you go. You've set that historical reference to be compared to. Yeah. Now, one of the first Newfoundland writers I ever read was Percy Jane's mm -hmm. House of Hate and a very, very serious kind of book. Uh, and I, I didn't realize that there Good was... Good book. Yeah, good book. But, you know, I didn't realize there was sort of like a comic tradition, you know, like satire and things in Newfoundland. Is there, you know, who are the, the people who were writing the funny books in Newfoundland? Are you in any way sort of following in those footsteps? Well, you know, I, I, no, I don't think... Th I think books are strangely new to Newfoundland. Uh, you know, people talk about this new <coughs> literary culture, and there's a big community there. You've got people like Lisa Moore and Wayne Johnson, Michael Crummy, Ken Harvey. You know, these are... And they're all of the same sort of generation, essentially. Mm -hmm. So it's a new thing. Uh, before that, there was uh, Percy Janes, Harold Horwood, and stuff. Um, and I don't think there was a real tradition. I think that, that uh, and there's a big tradition of comedy and satire there. Yes. And it's in the theater. Because I, I think Newfoundland is, you know, till now, uh, primarily an oral culture. And right. that's the way it was expressed, in, in storytelling around tables. Sure. And then just in the 70s, on the stage, you know? It's Codco like, and those sort yeah, of things. Yeah, and Cod, those are, those are, yeah, they're the progenitors of, 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 I think, the written satire now. Okay. You know? Um, you know, what about in Canada? You know, a lot of those Governor General award-winning novels are really darn serious and a lot of navel-gazing and things like that. Can you write a funny book and still be, you know, in the canon of can lit? I don't think, I don't think so now. I mean, no, no oh. I, I, I read a quote uh, in a review of, of this book, a, a very favorable review by uh, in McLean's, and it was, he's quoting Bill Richardson, who said that uh, comedy writers are seated below the salt. And... Um, uh, for some reason, if it's, and I guess this is, it's, it's a natural human tendency. If the book's funny, how could it be taken seriously? Uh, 
Now, comedy is a very serious business when you're doing it. You know. uh, and uh, you know, to be not to be part of the candlelit canon is possibly a good thing because not only are, are those you know those books necessarily grave and serious, they're they're very often as boring as all get out. Uh, I'm sorry to say, you know, mm -hmm. uh, there's there's a, a lot of stuff out there that uh, reading it, it's like chugging Benadryl. Well, I know, uh, yeah. I, I'm sorry, you know. I, no, I, I, I agree sometimes, and especially the ones, yeah, one Governor General word book I was trying to read, and I won't mention any names, yeah. it's just that there were five pages describing the drapes, and I really said, you know, I've got some other stuff I'd like to do. So. Well, you know, there's this orthodoxy now, too, uh, that says that, it, I don't know where it came from, that all detail is good, right? you know, and uh, that was so true for so long that it's probably not any longer. <laughs> do you know okay. what I mean? Like, yeah. right. um, and I had this discussion with Bernard McLaverty at the Woody Point Festival this, this year. Uh, uh, sometimes a simple declarative sentence without any details, citing any adornments, maybe it works better. Sure. Uh, you know, and, and if you're telling a uh, comedy like this, you can't, you'll get in the way of the joke if you, if you burden it with too much detail, Tell if it's too, too embroidered. Yeah. I mean, in retrospect with this book too, and, and everything I do, I'm beginning to think, uh, and maybe I'll change my mind, and, couple of weeks or something, that all the adornment uh, is bad. And, uh, you know, I'll just uh, sometime I'm going to write, I'm going to try to write really as simply and declaratively as possible. You don't go back to your book if you've written it, like the recent one is Nine Planets, and look at it and say, gee, I wish I should have done this, or if I could only rewritten it one more time. You don't no. suffer that way, do you? Well, no, I do find that uh, uh, when I've got to do, I don't revisit stuff. I did a radio show called The Great Eastern um, that was on the CBC, and I worked with a guy, Steve Palmer. And he had the ability to go, I would never listen to the shows after they aired, and he had the ability to go back and uh, hear stuff analytically mm -hmm. and make valuable changes in the future. Oh, uh, you know? yeah. And so probably there is a reason for revisiting your work. I find it, uh, I can't do it because it makes me stomach sick. Right. Uh, you know, and I better think, to move on yeah. to the next thing. Yeah. yeah, and I find if I'm at a reading, say, and I open it up just randomly to a page, my eye will immediately drop on something I regret having written. Yes. So. I, I don't. I try not to re revisit them. No. Yeah. Speaking of details, though, I want I want you to take us to, to St. John's. Now, St. John's is a fairly extraordinary city, still in my mind. I haven't been there for a while, but it's mm -hmm. unlike any other city in Canada. Um, could you take me like some particular place, a street corner or something, and give me a sense of, of what it looks like there and what what am I seeing? Um, well, it's a cranky city stuck on the side of a hill. Um, it evolved organically, so there's no real grid. Uh, so what would have been cart trails and walking trails are mapped the streets there. Uh, it's uh, weather-beaten. It, it it's, um, it's, looks to be tumbling back into the ocean sometimes. It's uh, counter-evolutionary. Um, uh, probably to fight uh, uh, the, the six months of rather dreary weather, it's Painted very loud colors. Yes. Um, uh, good taste uh, is is a recent arrival, uh, a regrettable one sometimes. Uh, it's um, a very friendly, open city. It's a talky city. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what else I could say. There about you go. It. Okay. People yeah. still gather. Writers gather down at the ship inn still, or is that more than writers? Uh, because it's such a small town. Mm -hmm. While, while small, it's cosmopolitan. It's a strange thing. We're, we're right at the, we managed to be, I think, sort of metro and yet uh, small. And uh, because the community is necessarily small because of the population, y y there's no way that a place would just gather writers. You would gather artists. Yes. So there's this cross fertilization. Hmm. And in the past, I mean, like myself, people sort of cross media to make a living. Mm -hmm. So in St. John's, the arts community is one of painters, actors, writers, filmmakers. They're all, they all know one another and work together. And just polluted with talent, the people that I've met there. I don't know, it just polluted and just sometimes just polluted. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the ship. Yeah. Your second novel is called The Nine Planets, and it takes place at a, um, a private school, the Red Pines. What kind of school is it? Um, it's totally, I have to say, it's totally fictionalized. It's not based, there are a couple of private schools in St. John's that bear no resemblance to this. And um, uh, this is a complete invention, this school. The protagonist has uh, certain design skills. And what he's done is he's uh, invented a perfect private school. 
which is why it has a prospect for it has a commercial prospects. So he's going to put it in a box and take it internationally. It's going to it's going to be a chain of of standalone schools. It's sort of contradiction in terms, but it's dressed to look like everybody the the, the good school that everybody imagines. He has a he has a, a display case full of dented and tarnished trophies that suggest a long history. While well, the school's only ten years old, right. uh, so it's a complete fabrication. It's um, uh, there's this, and I think th these days in the world, there's a craving for authenticity, and people are happy even if it's fabricated Fake. Yeah. authenticity. Right. <laughs> you know, you see that in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia too. I mean, my wife's from uh, Lunenburg on the south shore of Nova Scotia, and you, you see, I think a lot of people coming up, and they want an authentic maritime experience, yes. yeah. and it doesn't matter if it's it's completely concocted. But That's why they're, they're driving home with those uh, lobster traps on the top yeah. of their car that, that Buddy made down the street and it sells to the, the tourists, but they don't ever reach salt water. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, tell us about Marty Devereaux, one of your protagonists there. Um, well, Marty uh, is the vice principal. He was, his partner is a guy named uh, Hank, and they uh, chose who was going to be principal and vice principal with the coin toss, and he became the vice principal. And they sort of fell into this uh, position. He was a runner. Uh, and that's basically what kept him in the academy. Uh, but he's, he's fallen almost by accident into the education business. He uh, had studied English literature with, with very little dedication. Uh, and one of the problems, he's, he's, he's uh, childless. And one of the problems, and I think the, the tensions in the book that drive the comedy, is that uh, while running a private school, he he has a singular loathing for teenagers. Yes. He hates kids. This has happened before yeah. with school principals yeah. and teachers. It does. It. And more than that, I think he, al he almost, he's beginning to hate family. Hmm. Um, and uh, which is odd. I worried that uh, that would make him so misanthropic. You know, hating family is it's a taboo. I mean, family's a good thing. Right. And Marty to ask questions about that. And I thought it might, there was a risk that he'd be so misanthropic that it would put people off the book. And, but what I found, strangely, is <clears throat> men will say things like, Marty's hard to like, boy. He's, a kind of a, he's kind of creepy. And men are, find it more difficult, whereas women find him much more <clears throat> amusing. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think he voices things about family, love, children that women feel. And because it's such a taboo, Never, never say. So the book's working that way as comedy because he's, he's, he's saying those things that, that would, should never be said, should never be expressed. And that's, that's one of the functions of comedy. Now, your protagonists in this novel in, in Rare Birds, they don't tend to be um, high-minded, right-thinking people. Why is that? Uh, well, I guess well-adjusted people with a, with a moral center just don't make interesting characters in mm -hmm. fiction. You know, I, I, I'm not sure there is one. Uh, and and there's you know there's a whole lot wrong with the world, and uh, criticism needs to be made, and uh, perhaps people like Marty and uh, are the ones to do it. You know. Now your book is uh, some people would call it satire, um, and I want to ask you about the very nature of satire in a minute. Okay. Right after we take a little break, and we'll be back with Edward Rich right after this. This series is brought to you as a public service by Mount St. Vincent University. Welcome back to the show. My guest today is Edward Rich. We're talking about his novels right now, The Nine Planets. I guess both of your books fall into that category that English teachers would call satire. Um, I remember that satire could be defined as making fun of human nature for the purpose of improving society. Is that what you're all about? God, I, I hadn't heard that definition. I, I, I certainly wouldn't want to say that I could do anything uh, prescriptive to help society. <laughs> I think I'd, I'd probably do more harm than good 
if I was if I was listened to. And maybe it's a maybe it's a failing of of satire as it's practiced now. Is that it isn't? It, it, it just uh, it's the prescriptive part of that that description. I don't I don't agree with. Right. Sure, we take shots, and sure we look at uh, some of the problems and flaws in our world. I think this one is more this new book, The Nine Planets, is is more appropriate to describe as satire. Rare Birds is, is, is a broader sort of comedy, yeah. I think, you know. Yeah. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. You're not, you're not going to fix the world entirely. I, I'm not going to fix the world. I'm, I, I really, I, 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 every day as I get older, of course, I think it needs more and more fixing, and I'm more and more perplexed as to what should be done. Now, I wonder if I could ask you to read a short excerpt from your book. Okay. Sitting there on the table, uh, this is The Nine Planets. Okay, I'll... Um, uh, I, we talked about Marty Devereaux, the, the central protagonist, but there are twin protagonists yes. in the book. And um, um, the other one is his uh, niece, Kathy, and she's a 16-year-old girl. Um, so um, what I'll do is I'll read a, sec a brief section that involves her, since we, we haven't talked about her. Okay. And at this point, she's, um, uh, she's met up with a boy from her high school class that... Uh, that she decided she loathed early in the semester and in the subsequent summer. Uh, she's quickly falling in love with him. And he's uh, dragged her off to a, you know, a young person's uh, club downtown. Now, they're too young to be there. Of course, they're 16. The club was close with boy sweat, animal and unclean. It was slapped together like a shack with ersatz wooden paneling, queasy U of green on the walls, and enough cigarette scars on the bubbly linoleum floor to make a pattern like the measles. The works was tacked onto the back of some tumble-down shit heap, an old metal shop in the arse end of downtown. It had taken Kathy and Chuck at least a half an hour to walk there. The club was packed with kids older than her, though mostly still underage. The girls were dressed to go out, to go to a club, to dance, and Kathy felt self-conscious about her dull clothes. There were friends of Chuck's there, but he didn't go to them. He stayed with her, pressed to the wall, occasionally pushed up against her by the crowd. To be heard over the racket, he had to bring his mouth next to hers, had to bring his mouth next to her ear, and his lips had brushed her like a kiss, and she'd sensed heat at once sparkling and molten. They'd been there for almost two hours. Kathy would be crucified when she got home. And the band, a newly constituted punk country outfit of heroic nobodies from other local bands, a perverse anti-supergroup of fucked up refused to be knowns calling itself Nay Cindy, were only now mounting the stage. They were un underfed lacking certain vitamins essential to life. Their skin was the color of a shaved dog. The guy slinging the bass heavier than he round his neck was surely dying from the drubbing he looked to have taken. Oblivious to his surroundings, the drummer, dropping to the stool behind his kit, shoved a hand down the front of his trousers, adjusted his cock and balls, and done, studiously sniffed his fingers. The guitarist, made of smoke, was in a murderous rage about something, the sound, the light, the venue, the life. The lead singer played guitar, too. She was a black-haired girl, shoulder-length and neglected chains, sleeveless, pants dirty with something like motor oil, fat belt with a big honking buckle. She wore working men's boots and squinted as though 60 watts were the sun. She smirked, sardonic and doubtful. Girl in a band. They plugged in. An electronic hum crawled across the floor like running wax, like spiders, provoking hoots and cheers. The girl at the microphone swung a claw at the guitar on her hip and brought it back against the strings like she was drawing a six-gun, and there was an avalanche. There was a blizzard of cinders. And now there were drums and bass, a horse she was riding, and, sta and steady hammering like 12 tons of clock, and the second guitar, and the girl singer like a monster chewing rocks, and the floor was a storm at sea, and the horse was charging, and Kathy was dancing. Well, I'm disappointed that I can't go there right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah let's go out. Yeah. Place. Thanks for taking us. The, the book is called The Nine Planets. Where does the title come from? Uh, a science teacher at the school has taken it upon himself to paint, uh, do depictions of the nine planets along a science hallway in the school, the, the wing of the school dedicated to the science classrooms. Uh, it has eight doors in it, so that defines nine panels providing an opportunity to paint the planets there. Uh, Unfortunately, the teacher, uh, is, his life is coming undone, and uh, he's starting to go a little potty, I think. And issues of sc the scale of representation, of models, of the fact that there aren't really nine planets uh, start to compromise his project and they become a, an unnecessary uh, irritant to Marty. The other thing, of course, is um, you know, the planets uh, 
orbit the sun, and the characters here orbit and pass one another. There's that whole metaphor about you know, the mechanistic world and so on. Okay, no, I was going to ask you about that. Are there really nine planets? Because it seems debatable. No. There's either ten or Pluto's just this chunk of ice. Yeah, what's, Pl what's your take uh, no, on Pluto's that? No, Pluto's, a, it says this in the book too, uh, uh, Pluto's a trans-Neptunian object. It's not a planet, but uh, I think the reason they, uh, they continue, they persist to call it a planet is uh, something about the symmetry of, of nine. Right. Uh, and, uh, and we all grew and up and thinking and it, it would, there, it would you know? disappoint the kids. It would be like it would be like announcing to the world that, that Santa Claus is a fr is a fake, you know, because right. <laughs> you know it's, it's 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 understood there are nine planets. It would be stealing something from the human imagination to take, I would take, be a, take a planet away. I would but be a defender. I, you, I would, you would say there's nine. Planets, I, I yeah. like Pluto. You memorize them, right? So if you know if it yep. was not there, it would just be sad. Now I was trying to come up with a unifying theme to the two books, an underlying philosophy there, uh, and all I could oh, come good. up with this. <laughs> I can, I can take Life the next sucks. Interview. Life sucks, but yes. some really funny and amazing things happen along the way. Yes, uh, life sucks. Some amazing things happen along the way, and we all learn from them. Do I get an A? When the, you when get an A, and learning and learning is its own reward. So. Okay. Um, back to your film for a minute. Uh, William Hurt uh, was uh, starring in Rare Birds, and uh, just wondering, like, what's the in a short version? What's the difference between writing the novel and writing the book? Oh, you got to writing the novel and writing the movie. Writing, writing the movie, yeah. uh, you've just got to you've got to to scour all the details and asides out of the story for the movie. And the movie story has got to be straight ahead. It's got to be totally plot driven. Uh, if the if the the actors are good, they can bring the characters through that storytelling. But it's a it's a urgent storytelling medium. There's no time for digression. Uh, <clears throat> therefore, it's not as uh, intellectual. It's not as rewarding for the audience, in my mind. I love the cinema, but I think it, it, it you know, it doesn't do to the audience what a book does for them. Um, you, um, what, what, are, what are the other differences? Um, it seemed to me that it must hurt to leave out all these characters or scenes that you might have loved along the way. But I, I, did, I didn't. I doesn't, it doesn't. didn't bother me. I understand yeah. the medium. I worked in, in film and television before I ever wrote a book, so. Uh, uh, I understood the, the needs there. I, uh, no pain and suffering then, too. Was, there wasn't much pain and suffering. Okay. I, I, and I'm, I'm more partial to less narrative movies, too. I like movies that don't try to do what, what the novel and the short story do. Yeah. Did you have a happy childhood? Gee, I did. I, I did have a happy childhood. Uh, I, I think of it as happy, although my, my mother died when I was like 14 after a protracted cancer thing. And that, in, that introduced a lot of darkness into uh, a certain part of my life. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to take a real short break and be back with uh, our author right after this. If you'd like more information about this program or any of the courses we offer at a distance, call us or visit our website. We welcome your comments. Uh, my guest today has been Edward Rich, and we've been talking about books and movies. How does a novelist actually go about turning his book into a movie? I mean, what do you do? You walk around with a book and you find a movie producer or something? Boy, that's uh, <laughs> were it that easy. Uh, th my uh, book fell into the hands of a movie producer, and they were in the process of looking for a, a property. And uh, my book wasn't among those being considered, apparently. Uh, it was a husband and wife team. and. Uh, she was reading my book, which had just been given to her, uh, in bed. And during the day, they were discussing a property to, to acquire, to adapt for the screen. And she was in bed keeping him awake at night reading my book. She was laughing. And after some time, thank God, he said, well, what about that book? And she said, gee, I guess we could make an inquiry. And lo and behold, it happened. So it was a happy accident. Edward Rich, thanks very much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. And thanks for watching our show. I'll see you again. Bye.